Thank you so much, dear chairman, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thanks very much, Costas and the organizing committee to be here with you uh, this year. Um, I'm going to be very brief talking to you about something pretty rare, uh, which is uh, the transcatheter pulmonary valve implantation. The TPVI took place before TAVI in 2000, and it took place uh, because lots of our congenital patients will have repetitive procedures for the pulmonary valve. So Professor Bonhoeffer at the time at Great Ormond Street thought that we cannot operate on these patients again and again to change their pulmonary valves, and therefore he thought about this TPVI technique, and then TAVI followed two years later. Uh, it, it is listed in the uh, procedures that congenital uh, cardiologists do, pediatric and adult congenital heart disease, and it is stated in the ESC guidelines that it's best to be done by operators skilled in general in the care of congenital heart disease patients, and I'm going to show to you why is that. It does take place in organized centers because it can be pretty difficult and it can go pear-shaped, so it's best to be in a place where you have a congenital surgeon to bail you out if something goes really wrong. Also, the lab that need, it needs to take place probably is better to be biplane because we often have to switch between one plane or the other, and it's best to be done according to the EC guidelines by people who do more than 10 PPVIs per year to keep the skills going. We usually do it in patients who have the trilogy of fallot, but there is obviously other indications. And the reason that we do it is because the surgeons don't want to take these patients on, like in Tavis, and that is because they're often multi-operated patients, or they have other skeletal and thoracic abnormalities. They really don't want to go into their chests again. Uh, pectus, lung hypoplasia, other predisposing factors. Look at this child who surprisingly has Marfan's, and you see his, um, over here you see his uh, chest, and the CT shows how close the RVOT is to his sternum and severe chest deformity. Obviously, this was a case for us to do. We have three available valves for the pulmonary position, the Melody, which was the first valve, the Edwards, which is your Edwards, and we use it in the pulmonary position, and now the Venus P valve, which has been um, uh, implanted for the past 10 years, but it's only this year that got C mark, and therefore we have it available for larger RVOTs. The melody valve is very, very common. The, the downside of this valve is that it can get endocarditis up to 10%, so that's not very nice. The Edwards valve have, has a less incidence of endocarditis, and it's available up to 29 millimeters, as you know. And the Venus P valve is actually uh, good for RVOTs that the other two valves cannot, cannot sort out, and it goes up to 34 millimeters. We use it uh, when we have a conduit in place, best to have something in place. As you heard earlier on, it's, it's fairly easy air to do a valve in valve procedure or if a valve in conduit. When it's a valve in conduit, the conduit may be calcified and it can rupture. We also use it in native RVOTs when we don't have a conduit or a valve and there's been a transannular patch in place, and that's where the Edwards and the Venus P come in place because these RVOTs are far larger than the uh, conduits that are pretty fixed. We first started assessing our patients with MRIs in the uh, first years of the uh, implantations, but actually, except for getting volume volumetrics and other physiological information like the RV volume, um, we, we have shifted from doing MRIs to doing actually CTs. Why is that? It's because on the CT, obviously, we can see the calcium much better, and what we really care about is that the calcium is not very close to our coronary arteries, and that is so because, as you he see here on my LCA angiogram, you, the, the LCA ostium is so close to the posterior part of the, of the homograft, which is heavily calcified, and you can see it on fluoroscopy. That means that if I implant a valve 
there I might compress on the LCA. And that was a patient that was I aborted and I didn't do the procedure. And if I hadn't aborted, then we are, might end up in this situation that is from the literature, a patient who had compression of the LCA and ended up uh, arresting on the table. And as you see over here, there's an RCA and there is no uh, left coronary artery flow. The patient had CPR, the stent of the melody valve collapsed, and then there was re-establishment of the flow to the left coronary artery, but the patient died. So we don't want to have that. That's why I said earlier on, you, we need to do these procedures in very safe environments with congenital surgeons, with perhaps adult coronary uh, 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 experts, etc. So. What are the considerations? It's where we're going to do the procedure from. We're going to do it from the leg, we're going to do it from the neck. And then the size of the RVOT, as I told you, the shape of the RVOT can vary, and then the location, the angulations, the underlying diagnosis. So first the shape and the size. Look at that. There's so many shapes and sizes, and really, we can only sort out up to 20% of the pa patients that need revalvulation with the transcatheter technique. And that is because we don't have such availability to, to, to cover all these vari variables. The second is that we need to look at the tricuspid valve. Our patients are congenital patients. Usually, they, they can have congen congenital tricuspid regurgitation, iatrogenic tricuspid regurgitation. And look at this patient who has an Alfieri stitch on the tricuspid valve. And this has ended up having a double orifice tricuspid valve, a very dilated RV because there is volume loading from the pulmonary regurgitation, bad RV function. He needs a pulmonary valve. Which of the two tricuspid valve orifices am I going to choose? The largest one to pass my sheath in. And how do I choose it? With TOE. And this is what we did. Then there, is, there can be concomitant stenosis of the MPA or the branches, and if we go in, we need to sort out the periphery first. We start with periphery, sort it out, stand whatever needs to be stented, then come back, put the valve. Then there is other problems. Our patients have thoracic abnormalities, scoliosis, spinal rods. Look at this patient. We had to do modified views in order to see what we are doing. And as I said, we start with the periphery. So look at here, that's the RPA distal. I ballooned this first, then I came back, and I had to actually balloon the calcified homograph because I couldn't even pass a wedge catheter through this calcified pulmonary valve. The balloon of the wedge would not go through. So with the same balloon that I did the RPA dilatation, I came back, I did a very careful uh, pulmonary conduit dilatation to crack a little bit of the calcium, but not too much, and even so, I had an extravasation here, as you see, but it's contained. It's contained because this patient was multi-operated, and of course, if, if you're multi-operated, you have adhesions, and this is what saves us. But we need to be extremely careful. And now you, you see the melody valve coming up after the stenting, the pre a uh, mounted stand has gone in, and this is a cover stand. And we put a cover stand, dedicated CP stands from Numet, because first, they, they have a good radial force and they don't collapse. And second, they have the PTFE cover in case we get an extravasation, it should be contained. And then we test the valve at the end, make sure there is no pulmonary gestation. And as I said, our patients can be rather difficult. You see here uh, something on the uh, left-hand side. I've gone up the femoral vein, and I find myself in the left side of the thorax, and this is nothing less than a azygous continuation. So my patient had IVC interruption, azygous continuation, and you see here that this drains into the coronary sinus. What did we do? We went from the jugular vein, and this is how we do the procedure, as you know. And then sometimes our patients have to have their valves upsized. So we may have a child that's had a 23 valve, and now we want to put a 26 valve. What, what we do, we break the previous valve. So you see here, we use a high-pressure Atlas balloon. We break 
the surgical valve and then we implant a bigger valve in the surgical valve. And often I get the question whether a pacemaker and the pacing links is a problem. No, it's not a problem. Look at this patient, lots of pacing leads. Uh, some of our patients have epicardial pacing leads from childhood and then they have transvenous pacing leads and it's not a problem to have leads in place. We just have to be careful that we don't dislodge them and we have to be careful that the leads have been in place for at least six months so that they, there's been adhesions, etc. And Finishing off, the venous P valve that I said uh, just got C mark this year, and we are about to do the, uh, the first venous P valve, hopefully in a couple of months' time, is a good valve. It's got a lifespan of at least 10 years now. As I said, it was first implanted 10 years ago. There's a lot of experience abroad. We are starting our experience here in Greece, hopefully. Um, first, we do a CT or MRI. We send it abroad. The company tells us whether the patient is suitable, and then we proceed. The largest valve, as I said, is 34 millimeters. So what can go wrong from this procedure? Many things. So first, homograph rupture, very bad. There's been cases where the cases where the people have put a drain in the uh, a pleural drain and they just auto transfuse. Okay, we don't want to get into that. Then uh, the arrhythmias, systemic infection, endocarditis, thrombus formation. So thrombus formation, this is one of my cases. This is a Hancock conduit, but not very nice to put valves in the Hancock because you cannot really reach the end of the uh, ring. But anyhow, we put this melody valve and you see on my angiogram, there is uh, this uh, whiteness here. It's actually calcium, it's debris within my melody valve. What can we do? We can actually balloon it. We balloon it, but the, the calcium may go to the lungs. And this patient of mine, I had to balloon it. The calcium went to the lungs. We did a CTPA. There was some calcium. She did OK. She's on warfarin because she then got pregnant, and we couldn't revalvulate her again, and we couldn't operate on her. So this is a possibility. But we need to be very careful. So in conclusion, this transcatheter therapy for our patients is really revolutionary for them. It's really very good for them. It's good for the patients and for the teams and the surgeons. But we need to pick up the patients in a timely fashion. We shouldn't be neither too early nor too late. And the key to our success is, like in every transcatheter procedure that we've been hearing about these days, is the multimodality imaging and the multidisciplinary team. So it's not the cardiologist on show. It's the cardiologist with the surgeon, with the technicians, with the radiologists, the anesthetists, and the whole team. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jifa. A brief question from my part. Uh, do you have any long-term data of the melody of the pulmonic valve site? Yes, absolutely. About regarding the durability or the need of intervention? Yes, yes, definitely. Excellent question. So uh, it's been 24 years since it's been implanted from 2000. So what we didn't know at the time was that if you put the valve, it, well, the valve is a, is a contegra, it's a bovine jugular vein just sutured on a CP stent. So they would implant the valve in the RVOT with no pre-standing. So about 40% of the first few valves fractured. And that is because the pulmonary and the RVOT and the chest are so close to each other and are in our operated patients, there's always a lot of adhesions. So in every cardiac cycle, the, the chest would actually compress on the stent. So when we, and we knew that from our VOT standing even before the valves came on. So then what we started doing was that we always pre-stand. We pre-stand the conduits and the native RVOTs. We create a scaffolding, and in, within that scaffolding, we put the pulmonary valve. We don't have to do that when we've got biological prosthetic valves that have a ring. We believe that the ring protects us. Okay. Uh, yes, just a small comment. Excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Jifa. Uh, your techniques are almost similar to the TAVI. I saw you break the valve and all this stuff. Um, uh, I was uh, very interested on the case where you have compression of the left main if you were to put your, the valve. 
Is any anyone using uh, protection with stands, or would that you know maintain the uh, lumen? Uh, what what your experience or some experience if there is? Well, we, we just shouldn't get ourselves into that situation if we think that our coronaries from the CT scanning, and that's why we've moved from MRI to CT, if we think that the coronaries are close, then we first do a balloon interrogation to the full diameter of what our valve is going to go up to, and at the same time, whilst the balloon is up, we do a coronary angiogram. If that is fine, then we proceed. If we think that if sometimes there is a compression, we abort. Thank you. Okay, congratulations for your clinical experience. Do you have any data on degenerated melody valves? What do you do then? What's the first one question? And second, I, you present the case of a child that you crack the valve. What is the possibilities of fracture and you know a complete mess in this case? Okay, so both excellent questions. So the first is, uh, what is the, the, uh, the durability of the melody valve? And if you have experience of so, doing something after generation yes, of the melody? So the melody, unless it gets an acute infection, you can actually get some years out of it if it degenerates, because it will degenerate. It, it degenerates in about 10 to 15 years. So that is comparable with the degeneration of the surgical valves. And that's why the guidelines say, if you can do it transcatheter, go for a transcatheter, because perhaps the durability is even a little bit more. If it degenerates, you can do valve in valve. So it, it has been done up to two valves, and, and that is not weird to do a melody in melody so long you have a melody. The melody is tw uh, 18, 20, 22. So long uh, the patient is good for size. So unless you have a patient who has now grown and the 18 melody that you had put a few years earlier is not good enough for the child, then it's fine to, to, to implant it again. When you have endocarditis, you can implant a valve so it's a myth that if you have endocarditis, you shouldn't put a valve again. So if it's chronic endocarditis, then it's organized. You can implant a valve, and what we do is we cover it, we put a covered stent, exclude the vegetation, and put a valve within it. And your second question? Cracking the valve. Oh, it's the not child. a problem. The, you, don't, you don't get any problem with fracturing the. Congratulations for that excellent presentation. Just a short question. We all know that in cases that there is severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation and annulus dilatation of more than 50, 40 millimeter, that could be an issue and the symptoms of the patient will relapse. So, how do you tackle this issue in, in this case that you showed us? Is it um, uh, treating at the same time, uh, referring the patient? What's your approach? Yep. That is very common to have tricuspid valve concomitant disease. And then we look at the, the reason for the tricuspid valve regurgitation. If it is because of annular dilatation, because the RV is now very enlarged because of pulmonary regurgitation, then, and, and uh, depending on the degree, of course, then we will proceed with the valve implantation and assess the tricuspid valve. Yes? But if it is iatrogenic, tricuspid valve regurgitation, because sometimes we see the septal leaflet caught on the VSD patch, and there is a lot of tricuspid regurgitation, we don't go into trascatheter. We send the patients to surgery, and they do a pulmonary valve replacement and a plasty of the tricuspid valve. Okay, thank you, Dr. Zifa. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Halapas, uh, 